Hello, and welcome to today's Plant Services webinar on four ways to achieve top performance in your fluid system, sponsored by SwageLock. I'm Tom Wilk, the Editor-in-Chief of Plant Services, and I thank you for joining us today. To begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First, if you have any technical difficulties during today's session, please put your question in the questions window, and our technical experts will assist you directly. We recommend disabling any pop-up blocking software or extensions in your browser as these can cause issues with Webinar Player. Additionally, we welcome your questions during today's event. Simply type your questions into the question window on the side of your screen and hit the submit button. Today's speaker will respond to questions one-on-one -on -one after today's webinar is finished and also in a live Q&A session near the end of today's webinar. If you'd like a copy of the presentation, please click on the event resources on the side of your screen to download the presentation. Also available are two links to resources on SwageLock on-site services, including a video library featuring fluid systems and other on-site services. Please be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the Plant Services website within the next 24 hours. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. And now let's meet today's speaker, Mark Welsh, is the Associate Product Manager for Services at SwageLock. In this role, Mark focuses on developing new services and field engineer tool support for SwageLock customers. Welcome, Mark, and thank you for being here today. Thanks for having me. Okay, guys, so we're gonna discuss four ways to achieve top performance in your fluid systems. Um, a little bit about me, I've worked for SwageLock for a number of years, uh, actually for SwageLock London specifically, and then moved into a um, sales role and then a field engineering role, helping customers um, in quite a few locations, ranging from Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, uh, Africa, and, and all around the UK and Europe, um, supporting them on systems that I'd seen in the field and basically getting them up and running and fixed into the best standard um, that they could be. Uh, it used to be an SME for several different areas, the regulators and analytical instrumentation, um, and now focus on uh, some of the development on our tools and our services. So we're gonna cover um, the four key elements. Um, I'm gonna go into these in detail. Uh, and we'll, we'll get to see kind of what a, a top performing fluid system looks like. So our first area is pipe versus tube. I want to level set here uh, and explain the difference between pipe versus tube. They can often be uh, mixed up and confused. So I'm going to kind of cover the, the major key differences here. So pipe typically measured on the internal diameter with a, a schedule of wall thickness, which increases the outside diameter. So a, a one inch pipe typically is a, a one inch bore uh, with the schedule of wall thickness adding to that outside diameter. Tube conversely is pretty much completely the opposite. A one inch tube is going to be one inch on its OD and that thickness of wall is going to encroach on the internal diameter. Um, Pipe is typically uh, made of spools that can be welded in a workshop or threaded together for installation on site. Um, tubing is typically site run. It, obviously, it can be made off site and, and brought to a, an installation, but you know, typically this stuff's really easy to bend and install, and it's you know two inches or smaller as listed there. Quite often nowadays, um, very popular to be one inch. Uh, anything under one inch is um, typically tube uh, pipe is um, obviously a little bit larger and the materials differ carbon steel is very common in piping um, but can range to some exotics you know 625 pastelloids stuff like that for some of the uh, more aggressive medias uh, or aggressive environments and tube is typically stainless steel um, but again can range into some pretty uh, fairly interesting exotics titanium uh, 65 6mo 2507 uh, some of the the more expensive steels there so I, I you know this seems pretty simple but i thought i'd bring up this um explanation here 
you can see the difference in install between the pipe and the tube. Um, you know, we could say this is probably a, a three quarter inch piece of um, tube or a three quarter inch piece of pipe. The, as long as the flow actually goes through the, the, the system um, and we don't end up with crazy amounts of pressure drop, um, you can see the amount of connections difference uh, in the two assemblies here. You know, the, the pipe I think has 10 additional connections over and above the tubing. The pipe is all threaded. So again, how that's gonna orient and be located is completely different to the tubing. The, the way the tube fitting works is there's no uh, torque when that component is pulled up, that, that rear nut is pulled up. So, you know, you can just slide this tube in, tighten up the, um, the two tube fitting connections whilst holding a, a backup wrench on the threaded connection and it's installed. The, the piping you've got to orient and hopefully in a position where there's no leaks created. Uh, so the the installation difference is, is massive from a time perspective um, and a potential leakage perspective. So some of the other points about pipe versus tube and some of the types of connections we, we see in the field, um, these are all pretty much made to a standard when it comes to, to piping components. Um, the threads we use, NPT, ISO standards, the flanges we use as me, you know, if I if I request from a supplier and as me uh, RF flange, 300 pound, two inch, I know what I'm getting. Doesn't doesn't matter which manufacturer I get it from. Pretty much they're all made to that standard. Um, same if I go for MPT. Uh, one manufacturer's MPT connection is going to be made to as me B120.1. I know what I'm getting. It's a openly public standard what I'm going to purchase, A and B should fit together. The difference with tube fitting components, and this is where you know people can, can make mistakes, one of the reasons why I pointed this out, is there's no commercial design standard for fitting components. So there is no ASME standard, there is no DIN standard. I can't call something out from industry and say, hey, I'm going to look up this standard and see if I buy from this supplier, can I use that supplier's ferrules, for instance? Um, each company that makes tube fittings makes them to their own design standard. And that is really critical that everybody understands that because in no way should we be mixing components from tube fitting uh, manufacturers or suppliers. Um, that there are manufacturers out there that say it's okay. Um, Swage Lock would definitely say that that's not okay. And and for this very reason, there is no standard around those things. Um, to, to fit in component manufacturers will make them to their own internal uh, IP. So why why is that important? When people see tube fittings, they see you know typically these small installations, um, and probably think small installation, you know, quarter inch tube, probably not much danger. Um, I've highlighted, this is from our uh, tube wall thickness selection chart. And we've got a 16 inch tube here uh, with a, not the thickest of wall thicknesses, but it's the thickest one you can get in 16th. So it's the one that will contain the most amount of pressure. 12,000 PSI that that tube would be rated to and that uh, fitting would be rated to as well. So tube fittings are always rated to the tube that you put in them. So if that tubing is rated to that um, pressure rating, so is our tube fitting. And you know, with 12,000 PSI, you can easily see that if that's not, uh, if the correct installation practices aren't followed, if the correct um, components aren't used, so mix of manufacturers, things like that, quickly that 16th of an inch piece of tube can turn into essentially a deadly weapon um, where it's gonna cause a little bit more than an injury, I would suggest if it, if it let go. Now the underlined um, section here talks about the four to one design factor that we've got. Um, so, when I take a tube fitting and I say 12,000 PSI, that's the working pressure. We would actually say um, that this 
assembly, one tube fit in, a piece of tube, another tube fit in at the other end, could actually be pressured to 48,000 PSI. And if anything let go, it would actually be the tubing. The tube fittings themselves, if correctly made up, um, would actually be perfectly fine. Uh, they, they wouldn't fail. It's actually the tubing that's designed to fail first. So again, understanding kind of how these things are installed, the last thing you want is something letting go out of a tube fitting, because at that point, that's when it turns into a, a deadly whip um, and it can obviously injure people. So I felt it was important to level set there and explain um, some of the differences. Um, I'm from the UK. I did a lot of my uh, services in the UK uh, when I was working for London. And um, we've got some data here. HSE is the health and safety executive. Um, they, they govern all of our health and safety in the UK and they um, cover things like the North Sea and the oil rigs and, and stuff like that. So we've actually got some data that they've published taken from 1997 to 2016 of hydrocarbon releases. Now these could be leaks, these could be um, someone accidentally opening something that contains hydrocarbons and shouldn't have been opened. Um, anything that's reportable. So they gather these statistics and they basically publish where these um, safety incidents have occurred. So we've got minor all the way through to major. Um, and you can see, you know, we're around about 2005, 2006, some pretty bad situations. Um, and to be honest, I think this has actually come up on the right uh, slightly in, in the past few years. So why is that important? So the last thing we want inside a process pipe is for that process to be getting outside. That's um, not good, A, if there's dangerous media inside, but it, pressure itself is obviously, a, a, it can be a dangerous source of energy. So whatever's inside process piping, whatever's inside instrument tubing, we wanna make sure that stays where it's supposed to be inside the tube or pipe. So the, the statistics they've um, looked into from the, from the chart I just displayed, we've got of all the dangerous incidents, 40% of those were caused by hydrocarbon releases. Um, pretty, pretty big number. 60% of those related to leakage. So, you know, again, something that they can do something about. Leakage is, in my opinion, pretty inexcusable. Um, certainly on the, the levels we're talking here. Uh, there's good training out there now that shows people how to install this stuff correctly um, and, and mitigate most of these issues that I'll be displaying. 25% of those 60% um, are related to pipe work and tube. So again, pretty easy to install stuff, um, but, but a huge percentage related to pipe work and tube. 82% of that was actually small bore tubing. So I showed you the difference between pipe and tubing, the installation differences. Um, it, anyone can install a, a, you know, a small bore tubing system to the point where it can be leak tight within you know, a couple of days training. They're, they're very simple components to pull up and, and use. But obviously something's going on in industry where people are having these issues and incidences and it's leading to leakage and a myriad of other problems. So pipe work issues, when we look into that, some of these leaks were caused by things like fatigue and vibration. We'll, we'll go into that in a bit more detail in a, in a few slides. Material degradation is you know, obviously things like gaskets wearing, um, that, that could even be the environment that some of the components are in. Maybe the wrong material's been specified. There's corrosion and erosion procedural um, you know, that's typically someone's opened a valve when they shouldn't have. Uh, actually a low-ish number compared to some of the others. Um, but incorrect installation, those three, fatigue, material degradation, and incorrect installation are up there as the, as the top ones, um, which is obviously hugely concerning. The installation issues, we, we dig a little bit deeper into that. They actually started to break down um, in the industry what are the installation issues that people typically face? We've got things like feral error, where people would perhaps install a feral back to front, maybe drop a feral, maybe it's an intermixed feral. Um, but overwhelmingly, it's vibration under tight and unbottomed tube. 
So under tight fittings, typically, you know, you've not done the correct amount of turns to, to pull up the component. Unbottomed tube is the, the tube isn't bottomed and the ferrules don't have um, enough material uh, to grab onto and can slip out. Uh, and vibration is obviously, you know, caused by, say, compressors vibrating, um, issues with uh, movement. So, you know, a lot of these things can be mitigated against. These are all things, wrong sealant, material mix, tube hardness, all that kind of stuff. We can do something about this in, in our uh, installations pretty easily. There's obviously a lot of pain felt from these issues. Um, safety is pretty much the most important aspect. You know, everyone deserves to go home at night and see their family. Um, but it is only one issue. It's the most important, but it's uh, one issue. There's a lot of problems with uh, unplanned downtime when these incidences occur. Uh, consumption of resources is a huge one. I hear a lot. Um, I, I hear compressed air, you know, I've not really concerned about that. You know, it's, we've got a backup compressor, so what, it's running. Obviously, that costs money. Um, I did a survey back a few years ago now, but the site we did it on, um, we found so many leaks that by the time they'd fixed them, the compressor, the additional compressor that they had on order, um, they actually cancelled the order for that. And we're talking millions of dollars here. Um, so they cancelled that, they fixed their leaks, and they actually had their backup compressor, instead of running 24-7 along with their main compressor, it did actually become their backup compressor. Um, there, there were that many leaks on the site. So, you know, compressed air, although it's seen as um, the, perhaps the poorer cousin to some of the more expensive gases, it's definitely not free. Um, and obviously there's knock-on effects to maintaining this equipment. You know, when something goes down, that retrospective fix of something can often take a lot more and cost a lot more than that planned maintenance, understanding your systems, doing um, you know, pre-work on them. And obviously there's additional costs involved with that. So where do I start when I do uh, the sort of inspection work that I used to do? Um, I would start in the, the stores and the warehouse. Uh, I would typically look at how the customer's uh, raw material handling was, uh, what their material preservation was like, what were their processes of taking, say, a stick of tube out from their stores um, and take it out on the site to actually do some tube running on site and bending and cutting and that kind of stuff. You see a couple of photos to the left of, um, they're actually returns from our labo laboratory where you can see there's a couple of scuffs and scrapes there. They'll actually affect how the ferrules uh, perform when they attach to that piece of tube when they, when they uh, swage in. So if there's a burnish or a, or a groove under that ferrule where it sits, that's obviously going to create a leak path. And it might not be something that initially occurs straight away. You know, you, you assemble something, you leak test it, it passes. With system upsets, vibration, things like that, you can end up with these things letting go over time. So really, if we're finding leakage, um, that's an issue that probably should have been picked up you know, way earlier. There's leakage is the, the last kind of thing that we want to be finding. Um, we're actually interested in a lot more than just that. So starting in the stores, understanding how this stuff's stored and used um, and pulled out of stores, really, really important. Um, there are some standards that actually uh, are relating to kind of what I'm showing right now. Uh, concentricity, OD, ovality, they're all contained in the uh, ASTM A269 standard, which relates to, to tubing. Um, so this is, again, something that I would check when I looked in the stores, random sample of tubing, make sure that it was the correct OD, make sure the ley line that's laser etched onto the tubing actually matches what the tubing is. Um, Take a look at the heat and lock codes. Take a look at the 3.1 material certs that come with, with those tubes. Take a look at the um, standards and surface finish and things like that. All things that really, if they're wrong, any of these are wrong, it's not going to end up with a, a good installation for that, for that tubing. And then um, 
pre-install inspection. Uh, I've certainly been to customers where their stores they have a the typical parts bin. Um, there's a you know a bunch of components that perhaps have been used for some tests, perhaps have been taken out of service, and then you know get put back into service, and they've been used. You know, the cheap things are expensive. People want to get their mileage out of them, so using them again, they're designed to do that. Um, but again, inspecting those components to make sure they're still in tip-top condition is really important. It's going to save a lot of time down downstream and after the installation. You can see here, this is again photos from our laboratory returned components. Um, we could tell these had been put into service, um, but you can see the, the surface of the uh, kind of chamfered surface there that you see. That's almost like a valve seat with the front ferrule of the tube fitting coming in to close that valve seat. That's what kind of creates your leak tight connection. Um, with that little dink in there, that dent, that's, you know, that's, that's not going to happen. There's, there's definitely going to be um, some leakage there. Uh, and, you know, that's the sort of thing that could have saved a lot of headaches if it was pre-inspected before installation. And, uh, you know, they have to spend a lot of time on these things, a, a quick glance, um, and then moving on to the next component will pay dividends uh, later on down the line. So some of the considerations, we'll, we'll go through some slides of what good installation practice looks like, but things like thermal expansion, have I got anything that's going from a you know hot to cold through my system? Um, is it subject to vibration? There's some brilliant standards by the Energy Institute, sorry, guidelines, they are guidelines and not standards, um, which go into best placement of tube supports and how you should run your tube to mitigate against vibration. Side loads, I see this all the time, stuff supported from tubing and components hanging off of long runs where there's no support. I've got some examples of that I'll, I'll share. System pressure ratings. You know, we talk about thermal expansion at the top, but the pressure ratings of tubing and tubing components, there's a derating factor with temperature. So the same as piping, you know, do we need to derate anything when, when we look at these components? Um, Media, external and internal. Uh, I've seen a lot of customer sites where they're using uh, HCL media as a, as a gas, and they've used hoses or they've got leakage in their system, and that's created permeation both ways. Not only is the HCL gas leaked out and uh, turned to hydrochloric acid with the moisture in the air, but also the moisture in the atmosphere is leached into, permeated into the system and turn the media into uh, essentially hydrochloric acid. And that's, that's led to you know, systems just being eaten alive because they're 316. Um, typically you'd use one of the exotics for that, uh, but they're expensive, so people use stainless steel, but if the system isn't dry um, and there's leaks in the system, that's not gonna lead to a, to a good situation. Placement and support. You know, where's the tube being run? How is it being supported? Again, key, just such simple things, but can lead to so many, you know, headaches later on down the line if you don't do it right. And there's there's guidance out there for this stuff. There's a lot of literature around good good installation practices. So leads me on to good installation practices. Um, we've got quite a few slides uh, here that we can kind of go through fairly quickly. Um, determine the number of tube fittings and the length of tubing required before we go out and set our foot on site. Now I've seen people spend a long time sketching stuff up, taking it to SolidWorks, drawing it up or AutoCAD in it, um, and then they come to site and they've yeah, still missed stuff and they're spending a long time on it, but they've, they've at least planned. I've then seen tube wranglers that can go to site They've got a good stores and they go backwards and forwards and they pick their bits and they do an installation that, to be honest, you couldn't have even planned for. They're so good at tube bending and tube installation that they, they, they're just pros through and through. So I can't over um, I can't overestimate how important a good tube bender is when it comes to this sort of installation. So having people that are trained that understand 
some of these standards, how you would best install this stuff. It, it, it's worth its weight in gold because it's going to save you a lot of headaches down the line and perhaps safety incidents as well. So classic example of, of good installation. You can see on the left, we've got this annulus with maybe 50 connections. Um, they're all correctly spaced out. They're all supported. They've, there's isolation on the ones that need isolation. We can get in there and we can link check them. We can gap check them with our gap gauge. Perfect installation. I think this is actually a swage lot facility. So, you know, I'd like to um, see that kind of work. And on the right, again, correctly broken out. Um, there's perhaps too many elbows here. We could use bends instead. Um, but again, it, it depends what the media is running through these tubes. If it's things like compressed air, nitrogen, and we've got a decent tube fit in, and we've pulled it up correctly, and we've checked it installed correctly with our gap gauge. Again, no, no real beef. There's, there's no problem with that. I, I have actually seen this on a customer's site. Um, someone run a piece of tube or a couple of pieces of tube straight across one of those um, defibrillator boxes. Um, either that person was not planning on having a heart attack or was never concerned of having a heart attack or there was nothing in the box. I couldn't open it to find out. Um, but definitely seen tubing run across, you know, electrical installations, skids, stuff that you would typically need access to that after the tube's installed, you're not getting access to it. So planned routing, you know, stuff like that is just, um, it's kind of obvious, but like I say, I've, I've seen it on customer sites. And then uh, tube placement. This, this kind of goes to that planning where the tubes are going to go. It's great to say, hey, we only need to run from A to B, but understanding, is someone going to stand on that? Are they going to think that's a ladder? And certainly if we get painters in to paint any kind of steel work, I guarantee that, you know, if there's still work in the background getting painted, that tube's getting painted as well. And that's going to, someone's definitely going to think that that's a step rail. Um, I was on site on a compressor system we were reviewing. And I think we had a line that was around 70 bar. It was very, very high H2S, um, which 1,000 ppms of H2S will kill you instantly. This was, I think, nigh on 30,000 ppms uh, in this part of the facility. And one of the guys that was with us stood on, you know, one of the customer guys stood on one of the tubes on the compressor um, just to reach up to read a tag number. Um, I wanted to exit that building quite quickly. I was in a you know, gas mask, oxygen tank, all that kind of stuff, but I certainly didn't want to be around. You imagine a tube fitting at each end of that tube and it just wanting to pull out of the fitting. Not, um, not a comfortable situation to be in. So uh, understanding tube routes and, and where that stuff can or should root is uh, just as important with that human factor kind of thought process. And then, you know, how are you actually going to lay your tubes? Certainly if you've got more than one, correct stacking of them, spacing of them, allowing for things like thermal expansion, um, which I think we get into in our, our next slide. This um, at the top right, you can see, you could almost call these maintenance loops. Some people would use these for maintenance so they can get in gap check, leak check, uh, get access to the fittings, obviously, to undo them without kind of getting the wrenches too tangled up. But also this would allow for uh, thermal expansion and some movement. Same as the, the picture below it. Again, there's some you know allowance for thermal expansion there. And then to the to the bottom left, we've got a bunch of different ways to break out of a, of a tube system. Um, some nice, you know, kind of sexy loops to the bottom left. And then perhaps a little bit simpler in the middle, kind of use a T, an elbow. You know, if your tube wranglers aren't that great, luckily enough, there's pretty much a tube fitting out there that you can put in the system to get you where you need to go. Um, lots of right angles and that kind of stuff. So I, I think I mentioned earlier the Energy Institute. Um, there's a, a very good standard that this table comes from. This table talks about the spacing between tube supports. So um, depending on the diameter of the tube, uh, you should put your tube supports in every X distance. Uh, this is also in the Swage Lock Tube Fitters Manual. If you go on one of our training courses, you get the, the big blue book, as it's often referred to. 
and there's a table in there. I think it's this is where the Energy Institute actually get it from. Um, but the, the standard or the guidelines are called the guidelines for the design, installation, and management of small bore tubing assemblies. Lots of information in this standard about, you know, uh, vibration, dynamic movement, um, this sort of stuff with spacing. And it's, you know, it's uh, manufacturer agnostic. So there's lots of um, detail in there. It's just general, general industry detail. Uh, I, this one, I'd say it's an obvious one. Uh, but again, I've seen this, you know, the, the tube on the right, there's no way you're getting that out unless you remove one of the fittings, uh, left or right. The one on the left, you've got what I would call a maintenance loop. You undo the two nuts, obviously after depressurizing the system and isolating, and you've, you know, you just lift it out. There's, you've got access to either side that way, um, nice and simple. So it's that thought process and planning pre-installation, which can save, obviously, a, a, a bunch of time. This one, uh, coil tube. Um, you know, people coil these on a machine. I've seen coiled tube done around a bean tin, um, you know, the leg of a drill press. Uh, really, this isn't flexible. Tubing in its natural state is, a, is annealed when it, when it comes to the, from the supplier to the uh, user. Um, by bending it, you work hard on it. it. It gets stiffer, essentially. So there's, there's nothing flexible about that coil. Um, it's not obviously great. It's lent against the ground as well and just kind of hang in there. But really, the only flexible part of that assembly is that straight run of tube there, which is annealed and soft and you know, can be bent into shape. So this practice, I think, has historically been done for, for years and years and years. Um, there's, there's definitely better ways of doing this now. And a lot of people would use this to mitigate against vibration. That's definitely not the way to do it. That's a lot of mass hanging off the end of something that's vibrating. That's not, that's not great. Or they would do it for a dynamic situation where something was moving, like a riser or thermally expanding. Again. Not, not a great way to do it. Like I said, that's that's hardened. So these days, there's um, what we call rectoils. It's a, essentially a rectangle coil, uh, for for want of a better description. And again, Energy Institute goes into these standards about how they should be installed, which way the coil should point, depending upon which way your um, component is moving, where it's supported. So I think here we see um, there's some there's some ticks of this is what you should do, uh, and on the right we see that's definitely not what to do. Um, and I, I've seen some of these installed. People have used these on sites I've been to. Um, but sometimes the interpretation is incorrect, and the rectoils are installed kind of on the that typical right side, and the, the whole understanding of how the thing's designed to flex and move was was perhaps not uh, adhered to. Obviously on the left, um, you've got kind of a range of area that you can put the, the rectoil in, depending upon where your, your movement is. So again, uh, if you're a geek like me, these installation kind of guidelines are gold. Um, love reading a good standard. And then we've got um, vibration. So I, I've seen rectoils used in vibration and that's not what they're designed for. They are designed for you know, a good range of motion, um, something physically moving from, from A to B, thermal expansion or, you know, a, a component is sliding. Vibration is obviously a different kettle of fish. That's, you know, acceleration, amplitude, um, frequency of, of something actually wiggling around in space um, for want of a, a better, more scientific description. Um, and this is the sort of thing you'd see on a compressor, you know, gas turbine compressor where something's shaking, maybe imperceptibly so. So you can't actually see because the, the frequency um, uh, of the vibration. Um, and what that's doing to the associated tube work. We've, we've done surveys on compressors where tubing is sheared off, um, you know, ethane compressors and things like that. And just ethane has been spewing out uh, into the facility. Um, and that's, you know, that's obviously caused some issues, um, plant, plant shutdowns and the like. So understanding the best methodology on how tubing should be installed and supported 
is huge for these um, these types of install. And obviously how to measure this, because it's understandable to say, well, I know it's vibrating, but is it vibrating and causing an issue? Uh, if you've ever seen the rotary flexural test uh, on YouTube from Swage Lock, you'll see we, we waggle around fittings in our test rigs um, to, to ridiculous levels. And they, you know, they pass um, post test. Uh, with this, you would need to do some measurement to understand is, you know, is an installation an issue or is it not kind of thing. And then how to best root your tube. So is it enough to always be vigilant? I hear from, oh, I certainly used to hear from customers all the time. Well, we report issues. We have a reporting procedure. We have cards around the place. We fill them out when we notice something that's unsafe. Okay, fine. I, that's great. Um, you know, if we always notice something and we always report it, but there's there's a human factor there, right? That's not always going to happen. Um, the the second type of person I I speak to is I keep meaning to talk to, to the supervisor about that problem. You know, there's an issue that's occurred, um, maybe, and that's on the forefront of their mind, and now they've seen something, so they're going to go and report it, or maybe they just walk past it every day and. I keep meaning to, but they're busy. They've got other things on their mind. They get distracted and it doesn't get reported. And I, and I know this happens because I've done so many surveys and spotted issues that should be picked up. Um, these, these four things definitely happen. Um, I'm so used to seeing the issue, I've gone blind to it. I, that definitely happens where someone meant to report it a year ago and then they kind of just got used to seeing it that way. And then the last one, which I actually think this last one's unforgivable, it's I didn't even know that was an issue. Like I said earlier, there's enough training out there nowadays, there's enough resources to understand what's an issue and what isn't. So, you know, there's there's ways to educate on that to to really be better at some of these um, problems that we find on, on customer sites. So I personally feel that purposeful inspection is the key to success here. Having a plan in place to spot issues proactively, go out onto your site, actively looking for them is really the only way to fix them. Um, and actually make sure you've got that mindset where you're gonna uh, look for issues or, or potential issues. Um, the best practices, uh, installation can make your life easier in the future. So we talked about that install piece. Absolutely being aware of how something should be installed. Great, getting training for those people, perfect. But actively going out there with a mindset of, I'm gonna look for issues and not just leaks as well. I've been to customer sites where they have a team of people that go out looking for leaks. Um, so they can then proactively fix them in the next shutdown. But again, that's that's not enough. If if there's a leak, that's gone too far. There's plenty of other indicators of a future potential issue that you should be looking for well above and beyond leaks. So for us, our biggest asset in a lot of these situations is our people and our training. So you know, we have a bunch of field engineers, we train them adequately, they're now fluid system inspectors, um, amongst other things. But that's kind of my, that was my journey as well. Um, a person that works for Swage Lock got trained up and then went and did lots of inspections um, and grew, grew my knowledge. And I'm not gonna go through all these detail because there's a ton of uh, things that you should be looking at. So um, on the right, it's kind of categories. On the left, it's a few of the specifics that I've, I've pulled out. Um, please you know, contact me if you wanna discuss these in more detail, but um over and under tightened tube fittings is probably the the largest one there is is installation of components not being followed correctly um and then things like tube supports leakages you know caused by a lot of these things that we see here um and then always look at the root cause what's the analysis okay something's leaked why that's what we need to find out something's you know vibrating or well, why and could it be supported better it's always root cause identification is the is the key. Equipment, this is some of the stuff from my old toolkit. Um, you know, gap gauges, they're they're available. I would gap everything that I'd installed um if I was a, an end user. We have some 
tablets that we record our survey data on and we tag issues for customers. And we've got some cool ultrasonic detectors and things like that. I, I still think Snoop should be in everyone's toolkit. You know, look for leakage that way, but use the other tools to find issues before leaks occur, as I said. So what do we do? We found a leak on our site. It's a you know an obvious one. We've sprayed Snoop on it. There's you know it's bubbling away. It's it's fairly obvious. We need to fix it. What we don't do is just nip it up. I, everyone will be tempted to fix it on the spot. We've got a problem. Categorize it. Determine does it need to be something that we report instantly, or can this just be tagged, identified, and we can go back to it at a late stage and fix. Um, for me, we would plan document and then verify the issue. So, you know, if you're working on a system, obviously isolate, vent and bleed down, disassemble and then inspect. Inspect the internals of that component because there could be something in there that's lurking. You know, maybe it's not been pulled up correctly, but maybe the, the ferrule's backwards or there's some intermix in there or something odd. So this picture I bring up because um, you can see there, there's a, there's a piece of tubing that's supposed to be in a connection to the right and it's kind of bent out of place. Um, let me tell you the white towels in this picture, they are there to cover up the blood of the person that decided to fix the leak whilst the system was energized. I'll just nip it up, it'll be fine. It turns out they had a, I think, a back ferrule from a different manufacturer. Um, they tightened it up, it wasn't gripping the tube. You know, all the system pressure decided to discharge um, and not leave them in a very good way. So, you know, when I when I point out we need to assess these situations, depressurize, isolate, all that kind of good stuff, then it's you know absolutely important. And this is kind of the analogy I use when when we train our field engineers. This is one of the analogies that I kind of call on. So, lions and tigers. Um, the lion hunting groups it's audible they roar you know very very obvious that's the kind of process safety we're used to oh slips trips falls energy from a relief valve or energy from a vent valve the tiger is process safety it's secretive it's camouflaged it's what's lying inside that you can't see now if you mess around with either of them probably not going to leave you in a very good way the lion is definitely the more obvious issue. It's just you know, uh, a height risk or not wearing your PPE. The tiger is the stuff that we don't see when we walk around these plants very obviously. Definitely don't mess with either of them. So what would I record and report on um, when I do these types of surveys is, you know, this is a report template that we use, but things like the tag ID, the location, um, there's a bunch. Ultimately, the most important is categorization of issue. You need to decide what is the category of issue that I need to report. Is it a level one? I need to shut this system down right now and radio back to a control room, or is it something way more innocuous? And I'm, I, you know, I need to tag this for the next plant shutdown. So we'll go through some common issues. Um, there's some fun slides in here, I think. Um, there's a rating system. Everyone's rating system is different. I think this is one that we took from a customer where they had a one to four. One being this needs action right now, and then four being 24 months within the next shutdown period. Then we've got again um, another, this was a way more complicated one from a different customer, and some customers don't have them at all. Um, and we, we issue a kind of system that we use. Different leakage. You know, we would call this top left one a small leak, this bottom right one a large leak, and it's a really large leak when you can't spray snoop on it. It actually won't stay on the component. Um, the, the leak is that large. So these are some of the kind of common issues we typically see. Unsupported tubing. This is a transmitter with some armored cable to the left of it, and, and nothing supported here. It's all just kind of hanging from the tube fins. Um, Lots of static load. You know, this this is six months. There's going to be leakage here. I guarantee it. Vibration induced fatigue. Um, we have a a piece of tube that's tie wrapped to a stanchion. 
if that's vibrating away, I think this is actually a compressor, so it was vibrating. Um, if that snaps or if that rubs away on that stanchion and that tube lets go, uh, that's going to cut someone in half at the right pressure. So not, not a good situation to be in. And corrosion. I said about the HCL system earlier, understand what's inside and outside of your system. Pick the correct material beforehand. Again, you know, understanding not all 316 is equal as well. Um, just because it says 316 uh, could be made to different chemical properties. Definitely look up the 3.1 material sets. Vibration and fretting corrosion, things rubbing and then causing uh, corrosion because it rubs off that top oxide layer from the stainless steel. Poor tube emplacement again, fraying and corrosion. We'll get some pocket corrosion with that. Installation error, this one I, this one apparently was installed for, you know, five, five plus years. Um, and it's a relief valve and it's installed in the incorrect direction. So this would relieve nothing. Uh, obviously not a, a good situation to be in. Static load, you can see deformed tubing is the is the key giveaway. You know, the, the two nuts are not parallel to each other. Um, there's a bigger gap and a smaller gap. And hose routing, I could, hose routing is a whole other subject on its own um, with two plane bends. Again, static dynamic loads, vibration. Hoses are, um, or they're consumable as well. So again, getting the best life out of your hose, understanding how they should be installed to make them last as long as they can. And then this uh, this is like my last slide, I think, um, identifying common issues. This was a picture with, uh, there was so much wrong on it, I couldn't resist putting this one in. So we've got uh, dissimilar materials, uh, an intermix of, of materials there with the brass and the stainless. It, Again, depends on the environment, but this, if this was offshore, that would almost certainly cause galvanic corrosion. Spring guard on one hose, but not the other. So it was either important at one point or not important at all. Um, the hose obstructs the valves and the gauges. So if you needed to operate these in any kind of quick order, that's, that's not going to help. Not to mention the hose, depending on what media is inside it, it could be dragging down from that top position, um, just with with the weight of what's inside it. Uh, glycerine in the gauges or silicon uh, for high temp service. I'm not sure that could be rainwater. It could be glycerine, and there's just some leaked out. It's a plywood back by the looks of it to me. Um, not certainly not great. You know, ideally we would use things like stainless steel in this um, sort of installation. I think. You can even see a stainless steel uh, junction box to the right, maybe even an electrical enclosure to the left. Um, plywood, I would say, is a, a last resort. PTFE tape on the left, uh, there is way too much PTFE, um, probably because they've used a, a cheap tape. And then on the right, there's practically none or none at all. So again, not, not ideal. Tube support, that's actually the top of a tube support which has been screwed into the back plate there's actually no tube support there again you can already see corrosion on the edge of that that's that's obviously not ideal it's not going to hold stuff particularly well and there's a, there's some random tape on the tube support uh, at the top here again same same as the connection down to the bottom left not really sure what that's doing um, or what the tapes there for so a bunch of you know Funny but serious situations uh, with that. So ho hopefully you've enjoyed um, that quick whiz through uh, four ways to maintain your systems. Um, there's going to be an email from Plant Services with a link if you want to request more information. Um, within, I think, three business days, someone from a Swagelock uh, Sales and Service Center will be in touch, depending upon where you're located in the world. Um, you can read more about what we've been talking about today within the Swayze Lock Reference Point. There's a, a link to that uh, in the presentation. And obviously, we're on all the social media channels, YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook. There's some really good content on YouTube about installation um, and some of the, the things that we offer. So I'd, I'd say check that out.
and that's all from me. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mark, for that presentation. There's a couple of hair-raising examples that you provided there of poor installation practices and what people can do to remedy those. Um, we'll get to a couple of questions in, in a few moments here. I want to remind everybody who uh, wants this presentation to, to keep in reference, you can download a PDF version of these slides in the downloads area on this web, webinar platform. Uh, be sure to do that before we close out the webinar, um, although that those slides will still be available on demand for, for on-demand viewers. Um, with that, Mark, let's get to a couple of questions that we've been receiving from our attendees. Um, the first one is a question on inspection frequency. You know, in the start of your presentation, you mentioned a couple of good inspection tips. How often would you recommend uh, the kind of inspections you, you covered in today's event? Yeah, okay, good good question. I think um, there's a few, there's probably a few things to take into account. I would say um, certainly what the media is inside the installation, um, you know, mm -hmm. with, with less aggressive medias, less dangerous medias, you could probably um, survey less. But again, what's the criticality of that process going down? Where we've got some air systems that I've inspected where if they go down, they take the entire plant with it. Um, mm -hmm. So they were inspected every six months. We've got other ones I've seen that are, you know, they're kind of really, really simple in a lab. Um, if it goes down, they've got a backup system they switch to. That's every couple of years. Um, and again, it's danger to personnel. You know, what's what's a, a likelihood of an occurrence of a leakage or a problem occurring? So therefore, are there people nearby that could get injured? That would up the level of um, inspection that I would do. So it's it, and a level of connections as well. How many connections, um, which kind of takes us back to good install practice in the first place. Mitigating connections is is important. Okay, and it sounds like that the answer to the question is tied into the categorization of issue slides, which you had near the end of your presentation, where you can prioritize what is most critical, what isn't. Absolutely, yep. And and working out what that categorization is on installation, if if you're at the front end of a project, really helps with the back end stuff. Okay, we have a question on how long do inspections take, which is how long do inspections take? Uh, maybe I can reframe it and say. How many things or objects uh, in your experience can you survey in a day or in a week? Okay, yeah, uh, good question. Um, I think with, with small bore tubing type installations, I think I've done probably in a week, uh, one person, you're looking at like 5,000 connections. If, if they're within close proximity, I think that was a laboratory I did it in. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the more... Uh, let's say dangerous inspections where there's high H2S, you're wearing an oxygen tank, you've got a gas mask um, or, or breathing apparatus. You, you're looking at maybe three, 300 a day is probably a good number per, per person. Oh. Okay. Um, and related to this question, it, it's, um, it's, it's, it's what you look for. The question is when you conduct a survey, Mark, is it just tubing and component issues you look for? or do you include anything else? What should we focus on? And I wanna make a personal comment. I used to work for a copper and fiber optic cabling manufacturer, and we talked about bend radius and keeping cable channels clean. So when you, talk, you talked about hose routing, that really registered with me as, as, as a solid issue to, to look for. Um, um, so yeah, that, what, what kinds of things should people focus on? So I Swage lock, we've got a bunch of you know small bore tubing experts. So predominantly small bore tubing's our our bag. Um, hose definitely along with that as well. But if there was something that a customer said, hey, we would you know want to get you to take a look at whilst we were on site, it was something to do with fluid systems. Then ultimately, yes, we'd you know we'd put that in with the with the survey. Um, if it makes sense, okay. then we'd we'd offer it to the customer. I think. Um, if we certainly we would leak check things like flanges um, if they're accessible so although that's deemed as a piping component um, we would you know check flanges from a leakage perspective not from a mechanical joint integrity perspective 
Mm -hmm. um, and if we noticed anything was off, corrosion on systems, I've reported things like stanchions that weren't bolted in place, you know, the bolts were actually missing. Um, mm -hmm. So general health and safety stuff as well, I think is, you know, on the list. Okay. Well, we'll end this Q&A on a somewhat dramatic note. Got a great question on earthquake zones, uh, namely, are there any additional considerations for SBT installs in earthquake zones? I, I saw that question, and that is an awesome question. I've um, I've never been asked that one before. I am going to have to do some research into that. I've never worked in anywhere where there's been earthquake hazards, so uh, that has never come up. But I know plenty of people that have, so I'm going to contact them and find out. Excellent. And you've got this person's contact information. So, uh, Erson, you can expect an answer from Mark in due course. So, awesome. you yeah. know, with, yeah, with, with that, Mark, I think we've, we're just at about time. So let me first uh, move to close up by thanking you for being here today and sharing your expertise. No problem. Thanks for having me. Um, and on behalf of Plant Services, I'd also like to thank Swagelock for sponsoring today's webinar and also for everyone for joining today. Uh, this webinar will be available on demand very shortly. Um, once we close out, an exit survey will pop up, and we encourage you to answer those, those, those four or five quick questions. So once again, thanks to Swagelock, thanks to Mark, and thanks to everyone for joining. Have a great rest of the day, everybody. Thanks, all.